You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. David, you recently posted an article titled, I Struggle with Mental Health, Maybe You Do Too. And when I saw that show up in my inbox, I wasn't surprised because we'd had a conversation a week or two before Mm -hmm. when we were recording our previous episode. You and I ended up talking about mental health for about 15 minutes, and then we agreed that, you know what, let's have this conversation again, and we'll record it. And you've been very kind of open and willing to discuss your issues. And I guess that was the impetus for the article. And I, I saw the article come across. I wasn't expecting it, but my immediate reaction was... I think in the 25 years that you've been doing this, advising creative firms, this is certainly going to be the post that creates the most feedback and has the biggest impact. And now we haven't talked since we've traded some texts, but five or six days later, how true is that statement? Yeah, if we can classify it as impact and not necessarily separate the good or the bad, then I would say you're absolutely right. (laughs) I didn't really know what to expect. In fact, I actually felt like I should have talked with you before I submitted it as a friend to say, hey, do you need to save me from myself before I send this? Or I don't want to steal the thunder from the episode we were going to do. But anyway, back to your question. I quit counting at about 200 email responses from people. All of them were very kind Some were from folks who said, man, thank you for talking about that. I don't know what to say, but, you know, I'm with you in spirit, one form or another of that. But most of them, the vast majority, probably at least 80% of them said, oh, my goodness, I had no idea. This is how I've struggled. My father tried to commit suicide twice and failed, and now he's in a wheelchair. My husband had a mental breakdown and left me with both kids. I've struggled with this forever, but I haven't ever talked with anybody. My brother and my wife don't know. It's like, wow. So that was sort of the bit that was overwhelming to me because I didn't really know what to do with that. But I've been on the other side of it too with a couple of family members where you know they're struggling and you have no idea what to say, but it just feels silly not to say something, right? So you just say something and people's hearts were really, really good, but I just didn't know what to do with it, right? So hundreds of responses so far. As much as I'm sure writing that was cathartic and then all of the good sense of relief that comes with it. And I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, I imagine you probably felt like you'd done the right thing just based on the amount of feedback that you received, encouraging other people to speak up because I had people reach out to me and said, I had no idea. David seems like kind of the perfect flawless person. I can't imagine that he would ever <laughs> suffer from anything. Yeah. You corrected them quickly, I'm sure. I set my wife straight <laughs> after that. <laughs> I said, yeah, you don't know him like I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but has it also opened a can of worms for you? Because here you are trying to maybe let go of something. Yeah. I'll let you speak to your motivations. But from the stories, you must have had people ask you for help as well. Yeah, for sure. And in sort of a cry for help sort of way, right? Yeah. And I don't know what to do with that. You know, it's pretty much a full time job to keep me close enough to the sanity line that I just don't know. I don't have any skills in that area either. Like some people who are profoundly empathetic but have no training are really good at listening and not saying the wrong things. I don't know that I'm that kind of person. But yeah, I did. I have had some second thoughts, obviously. So yeah, let's double down and do a podcast to a (laughs) whole bunch of people. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I have because you you think, okay, so First of all, I'm a consultant, right? And people are not going to be interested in working with loser consultants or ones who can't control their emotions or struggling with. So that obviously, now I knew that before I wrote the thing. But there's also part of the struggles with mental health for me is just second guessing myself all the time and crazy thoughts mixed in with some real thoughts that shouldn't be ignored. Like, was this self sabotage? Was this trying to say, hey, people, if any of you don't like me, then just uh, fuck off, basically, you know, or this is me, either accept me or don't. 
I don't think that was any part of what I did, but there are times when in mental health struggles, you just want complete clarity and you don't care what the results are. And so that's one thing that I just thought a lot about, like, is this the right thing to do? And I finally, as with many things I've done in my life, I really didn't know if it was the right thing to do, but I felt like it was worth the risk. I kind of imagine 30 or 40 people out there who... I don't have any answers for them, none. I really have no answers. I have a few answers for myself, but they're not necessarily transferable. All I can do is say, you're not alone. I can't help you. But if you think that God has singled you out and is punishing you with some strange mental disease, no, that's not the case. As far as I know, I don't have a direct line to God, but that's my belief there. And I just wanted people to have this sense that even though I don't have any answers beyond that, it's like, you know what? This is part of what it means to be human and it's okay. It's not always fixable, but it's okay to at least know you're not being singled out and at least give you more freedom to talk about it with some people. So I kind of assume that the feedback I'm getting will die down pretty quickly here. And then five years, 10 years from now, somebody will send me a note and say, you know, that was an important point in my life. I began to just think a little bit differently about my struggles with mental health, how it's okay to talk about them. And that was really the longer term secret goal. And I know that'll happen. I've second guessed myself about this, but now I'd do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as your friend and therapist, (laughs) I really need another one. (laughs) (laughs) And you're talking about Before I finish that thought, you were talking about um, wondering if you're even qualified as the right person to kind of be guiding people on this or giving feedback. And I'm keenly aware of that sentiment in myself in conducting this conversation. So Mm. to you, David, and to all the listeners out there, if I fumble through this or say something stupid, ask the wrong questions or make a joke where it's inappropriate, I apologize in advance. I'm just a human being trying to be helpful in this situation. Yeah. Your point about part of the message is you want people to recognize that if they're feeling this way, either anxiety or depression or any other form of mental illness, that they're not alone. And I was on the Never Not Creative podcast recently. In fact, I don't know if the episodes aired, but Andy Wright, the host of that, he's based in Australia. They've been a partner, a sponsor in some research on mental health in the creative professions. I think it's just done in Australia, but I Mm. also think it's fair to extrapolate out to the creative professions in other markets. But looking at the most recent study, which was done in 2020, and their first study was done in 2018, we'll post links to this. But if you think of just the numbers here, in the creative professions, 20% say they suffer from severe depression and 24% severe anxiety. Now this is severe. And the quote from the study is much higher than national averages. So one in five, wow. one in five of us is suffering from severe depression from time to time. And one in four of us suffering from severe anxiety. And when we look at mild to severe On the anxiety scale, 52% of people in the creative profession claim to have mild to severe anxiety from time to time, and 56% claim mild to severe depression. So to the listener out there who maybe previously was thinking they feel alone, you are so not alone. In fact, you're you're in the majority. (laughs) Right. Oh, I just thinking uh, if you were managing a team of people and they represented a cross section of that marketplace, just think about the implications of managing folks who struggle with that, right? Yeah. It's like all of a sudden the handbook isn't enough. It's going to take being human and thinking and listening. And I don't have any of those answers, but is there something about this field? What's the connection? Does this field breed that or are people attracted to this field because they struggle with that? That'd be an interesting question. So Andy put that question to me yeah, and I hadn't thought about it too deeply, but I almost brushed it aside and said, I don't think there's anything about the creative professions. And he had a hypothesis around deadlines, et cetera. Mm. And I said, I don't know that there's anything about the creative professions. Obviously I hadn't thought about this as deeply as he had and his organization's a sponsor in this research. And I think in hindsight, I kind of gave his hypothesis short shrift. I was talking to Colette about it after the interview 
And she said, you know, I think there is something about, it's not necessarily the work that we do, but when you think of creative people, I've heard you say previously, and you're a big student of personality theory, that the most successful people tend to have highly skewed personalities, number one, and number two, they're aware of it. Mm -hmm. So skewed in whatever dimension, but when you think of, sometimes people have gifts on one dimension and gifts almost always come at a price. And I think our field has a higher incidence of people who have these kind of creative superpowers that come at a price. And often that price shows up as some form of mental health issue. What do you think of that hypothesis? I think that's very plausible. I don't have any inside information to know whether that's true, but I think it's very plausible. And to me, again, this a lot of what I say today could just be me expressing my own challenges and not really representing other people's. Yeah. But there's something about the creative field that the people who succeed are the ones who absorb everything around them. And then they use that information and they find patterns or they find anti-patterns and they break those. But there's no way to do the creativity that we're talking about without absorbing all of this stuff around you. And it's sort of like you have your phone that's beeping at you all the time and you can't turn it off. It's like your own version of hell. And I think doing a great job in the creative field means you have to absorb all of this stuff and it crowds out what you need to be doing to think about yourself. There's less peace. At least that's how I experience it. I don't know if that's true for other people, but that's how I think about it. That's really interesting. I have a friend who speaks nine languages and understands, I think, 13. And we've traveled with her and she's very sensitive to the point where she can't go out for dinner because she's overwhelmed. And I didn't appreciate it, but we're in these global cities where there are people from everywhere. And you hear this cacophony of noise as people around you are speaking different languages. And it's easy to tune out because you don't understand. Right. She understands it all. Her antenna is very sensitive and she picks up and processes everything that comes in. And it wasn't until she explained that, and I saw this connection between how sensitive she is to stimuli and the fact that she's tuned into all these languages. There's a connection there. And I'd never thought of that, the idea that creative people generally, to be good at what you do, you have to be good at picking up things from the outside, tuned into social, to cultural things, trends, etc. And you have to be empathetic as well because you're constantly putting yourself in the shoes of whoever the target audience is. And that means, again, you're outside yourself and you're living inside other people all day trying to think about, all right, what messages will resonate with them? What are they losing sleep over? And it's like you're a therapist to the world 10 hours a day and then you just stop for some odd reason and you realize, oh my goodness, I've just been thinking about everybody else. I basically just shove down whatever it is that I'm feeling. I describe myself in the article as a high-functioning, slightly broken human. And I think a lot of folks in this field fit that same category. I may be a little too generous with myself about high-functioning, <laughs> but I do think of myself as high-functioning. And I don't think that's incompatible with struggling in some way. I am not proud of the mental struggle at all. I'm a little embarrassed about it, but... I can't ignore it anymore. Like this has been a part of my life for, like formally it's been a part of my life for the last probably 15 years where I've said, oh, something's going on here. And then really acutely in the last 10 where it takes some pretty intentional efforts on my part to manage it. You and Colette were on the receiving end of this. And I think we mentioned this in a previous episode where I was just lost. And I don't know exactly when that was, but I think it was about 10 years ago, the same time I referred to in the article that we'll put in the show notes. But I remember like, oh, should I even call them friends? But, and I remember thinking, what must they think? Like, okay, can we meet at some resort in the desert and talk about nothing? Would that be okay with you? It's like, uh, (laughs) and that's partly why people like me and others who struggle with mental health, just kind of keep it inside because it feels stupid. Like, what are we, I don't even know if I want to talk. And if I did, what would I talk about? And like, all I want is, I want to kind of just go sit by myself at a bar with a lot of other people who aren't going to talk to me. Somehow that's what it feels like in a mental health struggle. And it's illogical from the outside because people who really want to help you, they don't know what to do. And you sometimes can't tell them what to do, right? 
I remember a family member going up to him and saying, I don't know what's going on. I know something's going on. I don't know what to say. I'm here. That's it. (laughs) That's all you can say sometimes. Yeah. And I remember that incident and I knew you were going through stuff and I knew we'd kind of crafted some sort of reason to get together and talk about each other's businesses, but it was really just about spending time together and being together. You know, I think of that incident, I was tuned in to an extent of what you were going through, only to an extent. I knew you were struggling with various issues, but the impetus for this conversation, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, I was saying to you that in the last, I don't know, year or two, I've just had my eyes opened to how many people in my life struggle with anxiety in particular and depression. So the depression is easier to spot, I think. Mm. But the number of people in my family, immediate and extended family, on my team, in my client base, among my friends, Mm -hmm. that I now see so much clearer that they're struggling with these issues (laughs) almost entirely because they've said so. Right. I think back to previous times in my life, even that 10 years ago, when you were in your kind of your darkest moments, I didn't have an appreciation for how many people are affected by mental illness of some form, because you said you're a little bit ashamed about it. And it begs the question, why do you feel a certain amount of shame around it? But at the same time, I know the answer to that question. There is stigma around mental illness. And I think what we as a society, and maybe we in the creative professions, hopefully are finally starting to get right, and we're not there yet, is talking about it and removing the stigma. I just think of how blind I was to the people in my life previous to just a few years ago. Somebody said on Twitter in response to your article, I guess we all suffer from this. And I'm thinking, well, I don't identify with depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of the lucky few But then again, as I was saying, there's so many people in my life that I see them everywhere. I wonder how many things I've missed over the years. I wonder how many people have tried to reach out and have a conversation and just say, hey, I just need you to be here. And I completely missed the cues. Yeah, right. Or even if you don't miss the cues, how do you stay in a place where you can actually step into a situation like that and not endanger your own mental health that much, right? There's only so much that can be done. Yeah. You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship. Your hosts are David C. Baker, author, speaker, and advisor to owners of expert firms, and Blair Enns of Win Without Pitching, the sales training and coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. For more information, go to twobobs.com. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling a friend and rating us on iTunes. Thank you. Now back to David and Blair. I think I would actually be an insufferable person if I didn't have mental health challenges. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for taking it for the team. Yeah. (laughs) It'll knock you on your ass in terms of your pride terms of how self-confident you are. If there is a God, then this would be one of those, all right, he needs solution 6-7-A. Somebody go to the box and throw it on him because this guy is going to mess things up if he gets too confident. So in other words, it just creates unique pressures that need to be thought about carefully. Here's an example. What would be more effective than waterboarding me if you needed something out of me? It would be to (laughs) never let me write again. Yeah. Because it's therapy. Yeah, exactly. It is therapy. So to the extent that my writing has helped folks, maybe not as much would have happened without this. There are uncomfortable, but still good side effects, side benefits from something like this. It's not completely a curse. It's just what it is. It's just the truth. And it isn't going to change, probably. I think that was a big moment for me. And this also could be read as the moment that I quit trying. I understand how that could come across because I, you know, I just don't know what I'm talking about here. But recognizing, okay, I am not going to find that elusive medication that solves this. So I'm going to quit trying. Now, somebody else, it might be very important for them to keep trying, right? We have different journeys, each of us does, different stops along the way. I'm not suggesting that's what somebody else should do. I'm just saying that for me, part of that decision 
was coming off medication. In fact, I remember going to my psychologist. I was on three at the time. We tried so many. And I said, this is just not working. We've tried everything. Nothing's been really significant. I want to get off of all of these. And she strongly advised me not to. And I said, I'm serious. I know it's not good to take yourself off these things quickly. I need help getting off them slowly, whatever that means. She was not willing to do it. She said, we'll talk about it next time. So I went home and this explains a little bit more about my personality, obviously. It's like... <laughs> I know you well enough to know where this is going. <laughs> yeah, you can finish this story. I go to Wikipedia and I look up titration because yeah. I knew enough about that word. And it's like, screw that. I'm going to manage it myself. Self-titration. Right. <laughs> yeah, like some pills you can't cut in half because, you know, they mix all together. I knew enough about that. Anyway, so I just did it myself. And never went back. I'm not blaming her. I mean, she may have been the smart one in that case. But <laughs> for me, it really helped to get to the point where I wasn't trying to find an elusive solution. I was still open to it. And I've gotten lots of really interesting suggestions from people. But now I'm going to live with it. I can't keep putting life off here. So you could read that, I guess, two main ways. One is like, I give up. And the other one is just letting go. Like I think the first step in 12 steps is let go and let God, as they say. It's like, okay, I'm turning this over to a higher power. Mm -hmm. I've done what I can do. I'm just going to basically live with it or accept that this is part of the package. Like you were talking about, you know, if there's a God and I was throwing these levers or, and I was imagining, okay, hubris is 8.5. Let's ratchet up anxiety <laughs> and depression to 4.5 and that'll offset. That'll keep them human. <laughs> like there's some lab up there with all these. Yeah, I picture it. Yeah, I can see that. Where do you, David Baker, go from here? Well, in terms of the impact on my business, my potential clients and prospects will decide that, right? There's nothing. You're going to have not, a lot of free time. Right yeah, now. I know. That's, so I'll have a lot more time to self-medicate, experiment stuff and all that. <laughs> but in terms of me personally, nothing changes just in the sense that, you know, certain days are harder than others. My goal is if I hadn't said anything about that, I don't want my clients to ever notice. I want them to continue to receive value and objective, level-headed fairness, no matter what. That's the professional goal. On the personal goal side, nothing changes because I just have to keep doing the same things, which it's different for everybody. In my case, it correlates pretty well with sleep, with activity, particularly outdoor activity. So I do a lot of that with getting rid of toxic friends and clients in some cases, managing notifications. Like I mentioned that earlier. I don't know. There's some, maybe it's just me, but the notification stuff just drives me flipping crazy. And then just keep delivering value to my clients and keep being as human as possible with my family and friends. So nothing's changed really. It's just, I kind of took a day out and said, all right, people, don't know if this is a good idea. I'm just going to tell you what I've struggled with. Back to your jobs. I hope this helps. There's a few things in there I want to pull on, if you don't mind. Yeah, nothing's off limits. Ask anything you want. When is sleep? And you mentioned in the article that you used to sleep really well, and every night you'd hit the nightly reset button. And then at some point, things change for whatever reason. In this mentally healthy survey that I've referenced that we'll link to, sleep comes up in almost every either neurological or mental health issue or just general as a biomarker for general health, sleep quality is almost always the number one issue. And it appears that sleep quality is an issue in the creative professions. But can you point to anything, and maybe you don't want to talk about it, but you just said you're an open book, or is it physiologically or just through aging, was it something happened where all of a sudden you weren't able to get the quality of sleep? I think my wife rewired our sleep number bed just out of torture. No. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it was just aging, I think, anyway. Yeah. I've only been through this once, so I'm not sure. That you know of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know how related this is, but I've had three deep spinal surgeries and four other really serious operations in that area. And there's been a lot of pain associated with that, and a lot of physical therapy or what I call physical terrorism by PT doctors. <laughs> So I don't know if that was partly related or not. I suspect that there's not much connection there. I think it's probably more, as I got further and further away from my 
childhood and both of my parents died, they were both older and it's not like they were in fantastic health. It wasn't some gruesome accident or anything. They just both passed away pretty close to each other. And I think that just sparked a whole lot of new thinking for me. As the oldest son, I had to dive in to fix all the estate mess. It was a whole disaster and it was very expensive. And you're doing all that, which has to be done, but then all these feelings are coming up. And I think that's probably what contributed to it feeling more like a crisis is who am I now? My parents are gone. What can I keep blaming on them? And what do I need to own myself? I am plagued with a mind that will not turn off. And I wish I could turn it off, really. So that just got worse and worse during that time. And I think for me, that's probably what precipitated it. I remember that. I remember your parents dying rapidly. You're in quite a lot of physical pain. And then there appeared to be all the emotional stuff from the death of your parents. And it just seemed like you got hit by kind of the perfect storm of physical and psychological stuff all at the same time. And we had a granddaughter who died at three weeks old. And Julie's dad died unexpectedly. And my best friend died from cancer. It was like, yeah, it was just a lot of stuff all at once. I know that has an impact. I just don't know how to measure it. Well, I mean, I think people listening to this, some people have lived that reality with the different variables and worse. And then others who've been kind of blessed, listen to all of that at once and think, how the hell would I ever survive that? Yeah. I remember you sending me a note, you're in your deep introspective moment saying, well, if this doesn't work out, I could always go do, and I forget what the other thing was. And I waited a couple of days and I sent you a note saying, what the fuck do you mean if this doesn't work out? You're David Baker. You've had a greater impact on this field than anybody else on the planet. Get your shit together, man. <laughs> yeah, this is you, my kind friend, being empathetic and helpful. Right? <laughs> the shoulder to cry on when you need one. Well, that's why I'm not even all that comfortable talking about all these contributing factors because by any measure, I have so much. There's nothing I lack and it feels like such a slap in the face to people who struggle with the same things that I do, but are thinking about food or childcare or losing their job, or it's like, I don't have any of that stuff happening. So it just feels stupid to even, and that's part of what happens with mental health is yeah. you feel like anything sounds like an excuse, or maybe you deserve this. That's the biggest challenge with mental health is that it is illogical. And that's why CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, it just didn't work for me because my therapist would say something and give me an exercise. It's like, no shit, I know this stuff. Like, I'm not learning anything here. <laughs> I would have been a bad patient. Oh my God. You're a poor therapist and you've joked a few times about wearing therapists out. Oh man, I guess I am your therapist, <laughs> yeah. unofficially. This issue of talking about it, and I just can't say to you enough, and I know you've had hundreds of people already say this, just you talking about it, I think is so helpful, so impactful. Here's a line from this study I've been referencing, Mentally Healthy. Compared to 2018, we're 24% more likely to consider disclosing if we've been diagnosed with depression, and 22% more of us believe that our peers won't be treated differently if they were to disclose a mental illness. That's a difference in 18 months. Mm. So there is definitely some momentum on this front where people feel like it's more okay to talk about these things. And I hope, well, I know your post is going to have a significant contribution to that. I hope this discussion will too. You opened your piece. It was so well written. I mean, it's such a difficult topic and it was just so, so well written. But you open it by saying, this isn't me being brave. This isn't me crying for help. This isn't me with any answers. But to that last point, again, not putting you on the spot for answers, but as you point out in this article, many of your readers and our listeners, they're in leadership positions. So whether it's them struggling or whether it's them opening their eyes to their team members struggling. Do you have any parting thoughts that you want to share with people on how they might think about things or do things differently? Well, one safe conclusion I think we could make is that it's really good to at least write, to be honest with yourself. That's what writing is, really. And because there's people looking over your shoulder, it keeps you honest with yourself. But even if there's nobody looking over your shoulder, just writing for yourself, I think that would be really good. And then being more candid about this with the people around you, not so that they will understand you better, that might help, but so that they can understand themselves better. That's kind of what we're doing. 
some of the most fulfilling things you could do are the things that you aren't doing for yourself, you're doing for other people. And there's just so much hope that just builds up when you have the right mix of outward looking, thinking about other people without using that as an excuse to not look at what's going on in yourself. So a good balance of that stuff. I just don't think there's a whole lot of downside in honesty. Don't take my statement too far. Everything you say should be true, but you don't necessarily have to say everything that's true. But I do think in this space, there's room for more honesty, even if you don't do the crazy thing of writing your entire list, but just talking with maybe your coworkers, maybe your families, somebody else. The solutions are different for everybody too. And it's okay to find your own path. And you're not going to solve this probably. You're just going to find some easy truths with yourself that will need to be maintained. You're never going to be able to withdraw the troops. There's an easy truce there. Figure out what that is for you. Be honest if it helps you, if it helps other people or both. And every day, it's every day. Get up every day. Keep doing what you need to do. It's like, got through today. That was good. All right, what's happening tomorrow? That's kind of how I have to think these days. One day at a time, as they say. Yep. Well, personally, I want to thank you for writing the piece and being so open to talking about it. And I know I speak for thousands of people out there who are appreciative of you kind of showing the way. And one of the things that I take away from this is if you're struggling with any of these things and you've benefited from David telling his story, just ask yourself, are there people in your orbit on your team and your family and your life who might also benefit from you opening up a little bit? The biggest thing that we can do as a profession together is to make sure that it's okay to talk about it. So let's keep talking. Thanks for this, David. Thank you, Blair. Thank you for listening to Two Bobs with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Subscribe and learn more at twobobs.com. That's the number two, B-O-B-S.com. 